Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is the next in a series looking at the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's episode, I want to talk about Russian oil and specifically the export of oil via shipping. So we've talked a lot on the channel about the sanctions that have been applied against Russia and the fact that Europe is now planning to stop the purchase of all seaborne oil. And this is due to take effect from December the 5th. So we're getting close to that date now. It's within touching distance. And so Russia needs to start organizing its sales to work out how it's going to replace the 1.5 million barrels of oil that it is still selling directly into the EU right now, with additional sales to India and China. Now, from a demand point of view, there's no question that China and India have the capacity to be able to buy that oil. They use a lot of oil and they import a lot. But the big question is, is it physically possible to be able to actually get enough shipping in place to be able to keep moving all of those volumes? So in today's episode, we'll have a look at Russia's current shipping capacity. We'll look at the volume of oil that Russia is currently transporting, how that's changed over the course of the last 12 months in terms of which countries it's actually delivering oil to. We'll then look at some analysis that's been prepared by Braemar, the shipping broker, which looks at exactly how many additional vessels that Russia will need to find in order to get these volumes moving. We'll then have a look at what's going on with regards to oil prices, because obviously volume and price gives you your revenue. So it's an important factor to look at not just the actual volumes, but what's going on with regards to the price. We'll then have a look at the discount levels that Russia has been offering over the course of the last seven months. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summaries to what I think is likely to happen over the course of the next three to six months for Russia in terms of this volume of shipping and what the impact of that will be on both Russia's revenues and the Russian economy. So before we get started on all of that, if I could ask you to give me a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Don't forget, I always include chapters, so if you don't have time to watch the whole thing, you can pick and choose what you'd like to see. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look below where you'll find links to YouTube Super Thanks and membership, as well as Buy Me a Coffee, Patreon and Amazon shopping links. And once again, thank you very much to everybody that supported the channel. Really, really appreciate it. Now, as I've discussed in previous videos, one of the major challenges facing Russia right now is to be able to find enough available shipping to put all of the oil onto if it wants to replace all of the sales that it's losing to the West with additional sales to India and China. And this issue is particularly poignant right now because the West is currently working on an oil price cap. So the concept is that the companies from the West that are involved in shipping insurance and brokerage and other services that Russian vessels will need will only make those services available to Russian ships and other ships that Russia is chartering if the price of the oil that's being transported has been sold at the agreed cap. Now Russia is obviously looking to avoid this cap and officially they've stated that any country that joins in the price cap mechanism will no longer be able to buy any Russian oil. So in order to bypass the oil price cap, Russia will need to have its own fleet of vessels and insure all of those vessels itself. And one of the big questions right now is whether or not it's physically possible for Russia to actually be able to get hold of enough ships. Now, if you've been following the channel for the last few months, you'll know that the Ground News app and website have been a pivotal source of information for me when hunting around for stories to share with you guys. Now, one thing that I really like about the Ground News app is that it shows you the reporting bias of that news source. So you can see whether it's leaning to the left, to the right, or from the center. And that's been particularly helpful when you're looking at issues such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Another feature that I really like and find quite fascinating is that you can check out the ownership of that news source. And you can see from these articles on Russian oil that we've got a wealthy private owner in India, private equity, the Woodbridge company for Reuters, and another private owner for the Economic Times. And the level of factuality coming out from these news sources is clearly stated. So if you're like me and you're constantly hunting for news stories and trying to find out facts, Ground News is a fantastic resource because it aggregates all of those stories and you can read through all the different articles and find out as much information as possible. So go to ground.news forward slash Joe blogs to check out the Vantage subscription, which gives you access to all of the features we've just walked through. And this week only, you can get 40% off the Vantage subscription by clicking on the link below. This chart shows a breakdown of the export of Russian crude oil in the period from May 21 through to September 22. 
Now, as I'm sure you're aware, the invasion of Ukraine started on the 24th of February 2022. So the period up to February 22 is pre-war and from March 22 onwards, it's post-war. And if we look firstly at the total amount of oil that Russia has been exporting. In February 22, Russia was exporting 3 million barrels of oil per day. And it's really interesting to note that from March through to August, the total amount of exported oil actually increased to more than 3 million. And in April and May, which was at the start of the war, the total volumes were actually above 3.5 million barrels per day. However, over the last few months, total volumes have been declining. And in September, the total amount has returned back to 3 million barrels. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, the reason that we've seen a decline over the last few months is partly because a lot of countries are making a conscious effort not to buy Russian oil, particularly the countries of Europe. However, this is currently voluntary. There isn't an official sanction in place from the European Union that prevents countries from buying Russian oil. And the other factor that's been affecting total volumes is the slowdown in the global economy. And that slowdown has actually led to a reduction in prices. But I'll come on to talk about prices and the value of the oil that Russia is exporting later in the video. Now, as you can see from the different colored sections, this chart shows us the destination of all of the Russian crude exports. And what this chart shows is that over the seven months since the start of the war, there has been a complete change in the sales mix. If you have a look at the key over on the right hand side, you can see that the different countries are shown by different colors. And right at the bottom, we've got India in very dark blue. Now, if you look at the first 10 months of this graph from May 21 through to February 22, there were virtually no sales from Russia to India of crude oil. However, over the last seven months, there has been a dramatic increase in those exports. So you can see that the dark blue section at the bottom of each bar chart has been growing quite rapidly. And in September, the total volume of oil exported to India was close to 1 million barrels per day. China is the next country shown on the chart in slightly lighter blue. And you can see that in the pre-war period, Russia was exporting significant amounts of oil to China. And in February 2022, the total exports to China were around 500,000 barrels per day. That figure has increased significantly. And you can see in September, the exports were closer to 1 million barrels per day. Turkey is the next country on this chart. And you can see that in the pre-war period, some sales were made to Turkey. However, post-war, those sales have increased significantly. And specifically in August and September, there was a major increase in the volume of exports. Italy is the next country on the chart. And I think this is a really interesting situation because pre-war, Italy was importing a reasonable amount of oil, although the amounts did fall in January and February. But over the seven months of the war shown on this graph, there has been a significant increase in the amount of oil that Italy is importing. Now, as I said at the start of the video, there isn't actually an embargo on European countries buying Russian oil right now. It's a voluntary arrangement. Most countries have stated that they don't want to keep buying Russian oil, but there isn't actually any penalty for doing so. So Italy is perfectly entitled to increase the amount it's buying. And it's been reported in the press that there are two reasons why Italy has significantly increased its purchases. Firstly, it's been taking advantage of the discounts that's been offered on Russian oil. So it's cheaper to buy Russian oil than it is to buy US or Qatar or Saudi Arabian oil. And secondly, one of the largest oil refineries in Italy is actually owned directly by a Russian company. And that Russian company has been trying to move as much volume as possible through that refinery. The next country shown on the list is the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is a relatively small country from a population point of view. But because of its history and its coastal location and its situation in the middle of Europe, it's actually one of the biggest refiners of oils. So Europe's largest refinery is based in the Netherlands. So it's a middleman. It buys in a lot of oil, it refines that product, and then it sells it to a variety of other countries. And you can see that in the period up until the start of the war, the Netherlands was a major buyer of Russian oil. However, you can also see that over the last seven months, there has been a significant reduction in the amount of oil that the Netherlands is buying from Russia. Bulgaria is the next country on this list and sales are shown in pink. And you can see that pre-war Bulgaria was buying a small amount of oil, but post-war it's actually increased its purchases significantly. And again, this is to take account of the discounts that are being offered on Russian oil. Now, if we look at the next four countries as a batch, Poland, Romania, Lithuania, and South Korea were buying significant amounts of Russian oil prior to the war. However, if you look at the chart, you can see that there has been a dramatic reduction in those purchases. 
and they are now very small. And then I think one of the most surprising things about this chart is the sale of Russian oil to the rest of the world, excluding these 10 countries we've just talked about. And you can see that prior to the start of the war, there was a significant amount of sales, almost a million barrels per day back in May 21, were being sold to other countries. However, over the course of the last seven months, we've seen a dramatic reduction in those sales. And in September 2022, the figure was minuscule, less than 200,000 barrels per day. And that represents a really big problem for Russia. Because as we move forward and the EU ban comes into place, all of the sales to the European countries on this list, excluding Bulgaria that has an exemption, will disappear. And Russia is struggling to find other markets to be able to sell into. So it shows that it's really dependent on India, China and Turkey taking up the slack on all of those volumes. This chart, which has been put together by the head of tanker research at brokerage Braemar, summarises the problem from Russia's perspective. Now, when we're talking about oil tankers, which are required to transport large volumes of oil, we've got different classifications which relate to different sizes. This chart shows the most commonly used oil tankers in the world, and the very largest of all of them are the ultra-large crude carriers. And these ships are absolutely huge, being around 415 meters or 1,350 feet long, and they can carry up to 3.7 million barrels of oil. But the problem with the ultra-large crude carriers is that there are only a limited number of ports in the world that are able to accept them because they are so large. The next largest vehicles are very large crude carriers, which are 330 meters or around 1,000 feet long, and they can carry up to 2 million barrels of oil. The next largest is the Suez Max, which, as the name indicates, is the largest size of ship that can fit through the Suez Canal. And those vessels are around 285 meters or 940 feet long, and they can carry up to 1 million barrels of oil. We then have the Aframax, which is 255 meters long or 840 feet which can carry around 600,000 barrels of oil. And then finally, we have coastal tankers, which are around 200 meters or 675 feet long and carry around 450,000 barrels of oil. So jumping back to this chart, the section at the top shows the total number of tankers required by Russia to be able to transport the 3.5 million barrels of oil that it currently sells on the seas. And it's estimated that Russia will need 157 Aframaxes, 65 Suez Maxes, and 18 very large crude carriers to be able to move those volumes each year. Now, if we look at the current situation with regards to what Russia has access to, the Russian owned fleet currently consists of 50 Aframaxes and 10 Suez Maxes. So it doesn't have any very large crude carriers. Now, in terms of monitoring the global fleet, there are a variety of vessels that have been acquired so far in 2022 that have not officially been registered, so the ownership is not known. But Braemar have given the benefit of the doubt and assumed that all of these vessels have been acquired by Russian entities. And these figures are shown next on the chart and include 50 Aframaxes, 10 Suez Maxes, and 15 very large crude carriers. So if we assume that Russia has full access to all of these vessels, Russia is still facing a shortfall of 110 tankers to be able to transport all of its oil. So that obviously represents a massive problem for Russia because it's looking to replace all of its lost sales by increasing its volumes to India and China. But if it doesn't have access to ships to be able to move the oil, then it will be impossible to agree those sales even if they could find a price that was acceptable. But the situation is actually worse than that because through the winter months, a lot of the oil fields that Russia is using and a lot of the ports are very cold and tend to freeze up. And therefore they need to use what's called ice class vessels. So vessels that are able to break through ice and sail through icy waters. And because not all tankers are built and designed to sail through icy waters, that's going to make it even harder for Russia to be able to find those missing vessels. So what all of this means from Russia's perspective is that it's very likely that they won't be able to ship anywhere near the volume of oil that they've been doing historically because they can't get access to the ships. And secondly, and probably most importantly from Russia's perspective, they simply won't be able to avoid the oil price cap 
that the West is looking to impose. Because the main way they were looking to do that was by bypassing all of the need to use any of the West's shipping and any of the West services and build their own. But if they can't get access to the volume of ships, then they've got the choice of either agreeing to the cap or facing an enormous reduction in sales volumes. This chart shows the movement in crude oil prices over the last 12 months. And if you follow the channel, I'm sure you'll have seen this chart before. It's got a very familiar shape to it. And what this shows is that at the beginning of December 2021, the price of a barrel of oil had dropped to around $66. However, as Russia started to build its troops on the border of Ukraine, and the world started to become nervous that Russia potentially could actually launch an invasion, oil prices started to move upwards. And by the 23rd of February, which was the day before the invasion started, a price of a barrel of oil was $90. As soon as the invasion was launched, prices skyrocketed and at one stage rose above $120. It's showing as $120 on this chart, but there were reports of trades taking place at $138. And at that time, there was concern in the market that the price of a barrel of oil could actually go up to $200. However, that didn't occur because it transpired that even though Europe was against Russia's invasion, they were still prepared to buy oil, mainly because European countries didn't really have much other choice. They needed to change their supply chains. They needed to change the way everything operated. So in the short to medium term, the reality was that Europe would need to keep buying Russian oil. And so prices, whilst they remained volatile, didn't go up to anywhere near $200. But in the period between the end of February and the start of June, Prices remained high and traded somewhere between $100 and $120. In the early stages of this war, a number of things happened. Firstly, the price of oil, as we can see here, rose, but the price of natural gas also rose, and that was a major problem for a lot of European countries that were highly dependent upon it, and the price of food substances also increased. And the combination of those factors led to more pressure on inflation, and as a direct result of high rates of inflation, central banks all around the world started to raise interest rates. And those increases in interest rates obviously caused the price of debt to increase. And as a result, we started to see a slowdown in the global economy. And by the beginning of June, all of the forecasts for the rest of 2022 had been downgraded in terms of economic growth. And at the same time as that, China was also continuing with its zero tolerance COVID policy and was locking down cities all across the nation. And at one point, it was reported that over 300 million people in China were involved in some form of lockdown. And the combination of the global slowdown and the enforced closures in China led to a reduction in demand for oil. And as you'll know if you follow the channel, if demand falls, then generally price comes down with it. And you can see from this chart what's happened to the price of oil over the last three or four months. There has been a marked reduction. And on the 26th of September, the price of a barrel of oil actually fell to $76, which is the lowest price that we've seen in 2022. Now, in response to falling prices, the OPEC plus nations, which are 22 countries that supply oil to the markets, decided that they were going to cut the level of their supplies because they were more focused on keeping the price up rather than selling large volumes. And as a result of that announcement and also the fact that the European Union has announced that it is banning the purchase of all seaborne Russian oil from the 5th of December, we have seen prices starting to creep back up. However, the current price is nowhere near what we saw at the beginning of the war. And there are concerns that going through to the end of this year and into 2023, that the global slowdown and the continued reduction in demand for oil will mean that oil prices will start to reduce again. And obviously, from a producer's point of view, from a country like Russia's perspective, that's bad news because if oil prices are falling, then that's going to mean a reduction in your revenue if you're selling the same volumes. But if you're actually selling lower volumes because you can't find enough ships to be able to move all of the oil to India and China from the sales that you lost to Europe, then clearly that's going to be a double whammy. And then on top of that, there's a potential triple whammy because Russia has been selling lots of its oil at a discount to encourage countries like India and China to actually buy it in view of the fact that they could run the risk of facing sanctions. So let's have a look at the oil discounts that Russia have been offering over the course of the last seven or eight months. 
This chart shows the price difference between Russia's crude oil and Brent crude oil since the start of February 2022. So you can see that at the start of this period, there was virtually no difference between Russian crude and Brent crude. However, almost instantly after the invasion started, there was a huge drop in the price of Russian crude. And at the start of March, the average price of a barrel of Russian crude was trading for around $28 less than it was for Brent crude. And over the course of the next month, as the war continued and more countries made a conscious decision not to buy Russian oil, the discount actually increased further. And by the start of April, it was around $35 per barrel. So that means that despite the fact that the market price of oil was around $100 per barrel at that time, Russia was only achieving a price of around $65 for the sale of all of its oil. So the increased volumes that Russia was seeing at that time of around 15% were being more than offset by a 35% reduction in the price. So on a net basis, Russia was actually doing worse from a total revenue perspective. And if we look at this graph, you can see that for the four month period from the start of April through to the start of August, that discount remained fairly constant at around $35 per barrel. And over that period, we've seen prices starting to come down significantly. So as I just showed you, from the highs that we saw at the end of May of around $110, we're now down to around $85. And a $35 discount against an $85 price obviously takes the price for Russia down to $50 per barrel. And we haven't seen a market price of $50 per barrel for years. Now, as you can see from this chart, over the course of the last month or so, Russia has actually started to reduce the amount of discount that it's offering to purchasers. And it's interesting that over that period, Russia has seen a reduction in the amount of exports, as I just showed you in the chart earlier. So what this tells us is that buyers are price sensitive. If Russia isn't offering these significant discounts, then they would prefer to buy their oil from somebody else. And that puts Russia into a very difficult situation because they don't want to keep selling oil at a massive discount because on a net basis, they're losing out. But the problem they're facing is that if they do try to increase their prices, they lose volume and therefore lose revenue because they're not getting the sales. So it's catch 22. They found themselves in a very difficult situation here. People will buy Russian oil if it's cheap, but if it isn't cheap, then the downside of doing that is too high and India and China would prefer to buy their oil from elsewhere. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because it's very easy to assume that when Russia loses all of its sales to Europe, it will simply flip a switch and send all of that oil directly to India and China. That, from an economic point of view, would make absolute sense for Russia. But obviously, from a practical point of view, it's not quite as simple as just flipping a switch because you need to find hundreds of additional vessels. And right now, there is a lot of demand for shipping because as Europe switches off all of its purchases from Russia, obviously, it's still using oil. So they're not stopping using all fossil fuels. What they're doing is buying that oil from somebody else. And a lot of that oil is coming from the US and the Middle East. And that needs to be put onto ships and delivered to Europe. So there's a big change in terms of the supply chain right now. A lot of countries are demanding more shipping. And this is coming at a bad time for Russia because they're needing to find that extra capacity when demand is rising in the market. And of course, the sanctions won't make life any easier for Russia because all of the Western companies that are involved in shipping will not want to be transporting any Russian oil unless it complies with the oil price cap that's due to come in on December the 5th. So the details of the cap have yet to be announced, but it's rumored that the price is going to be set at somewhere around $63 per barrel. And the reason it's being set at that level is that it allows Russia to earn a very small profit. And of course, the last thing that Russia wants to do is to agree to this price cap. So realistically, in order to avoid the price cap, Russia needs to find vessels that are not coming from the West. And that's really the point of today's video. And we looked at the data and it showed that Russia needs around 110 additional vessels compared to what it has right now. And that is a big demand, particularly when you think about the fact that a lot of these vessels will also need to be able to sail through icy waters, these icebreaker vessels. There aren't that many of those around. So this is going to be really challenging from Russia's point of view to be able to find that volume of ships. 
But even if it did find the volume, even if it was able to miraculously find 110 vessels, the other problem that Russia faces are the market prices. So as we've just seen, market prices are coming down. Over the course of the last three or four months, we've seen a marked reduction. So that's bad news if you're an oil producer, because obviously your revenues will be going down. It's particularly bad news if you're having to invest in new infrastructure. If you're hiring or buying more ships, then obviously there's a large amount of capital investment there. And so you need your prices to be as high as possible to cover those additional costs. But what we're seeing from Russia's perspective is actually they're having to offer large discounts in order to encourage people to buy their oil in the face of the sanctions. So this is really a double whammy from Russia's perspective. Their costs are going up at the same time as their revenue is going down. So the overall summary of today's video is that firstly, it's going to be extremely challenging for Russia to be able to find enough ships to be able to replace all of the lost sales to Europe with more sales to India and China. Secondly, prices are going down in the market right now. So that's bad news from their perspective. And thirdly, they're having to offer discounts in addition to the falling prices in order to encourage people to buy. So this is really bad news from a revenue point of view. And my guess here is that Russia will struggle to find all of the additional ships to be able to put the additional volume to India and China onto. So that means that they'll see reduced volumes. And alongside that, it's likely that they'll be getting a lower sales price. So when you combine lower volumes and lower sales prices, that means that there's going to be a big hit for Russian revenues as a result of this oil price ban and potentially the oil price cap kicking in on December the 5th. So hopefully that's given you a better understanding as to why it is difficult for Russia to be able to pivot and sell more oil directly to India and China through the course of the next few months because the oil price cap is going to be a problem, the sanctions are going to be a problem and obviously the European Union is stopping buying all oil on December the 5th. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's video, you found it interesting, thought-provoking and educational. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already.